Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Lindsay Sedonis. I'm the Director of Development and Alumni Alumni Relations here at Northeastern Law. We are thrilled to welcome you to campus for the 15th annual Judith Owens Brown Forum for Women in the Law Conference. Thanks to your philanthropy and the hard work of our volunteers, this conference truly gets better every single year. Um, but before we get started with our official speaking program, I first want to share something that one of our graduates said to me while our team was in D.C. last month. He said, quote, take a moment to consider what a blessing it is for you to be at Northeastern Law. It is a very special place, end quote. Well, I could not agree more. While the legal field struggles with diversity, our students, faculty, and staff actually do reflect the diversity we see throughout the United States population. We are consistently ranked as the top public interest law school in the country. We are regularly recognized, or we were recently recognized as the queerest law school in the country. And we regularly... <laughs> and we regularly bring people together for conversations on themes like the one we have today. One that proudly states that women's rights are, in fact, human rights. And now it's my pleasure to introduce to you the person who has helped Northeastern Law accomplish all of this. He makes sure that our social justice mission is at the heart of everything we do, while also finding new ways to create an accessible, welcoming, and supportive environment for students, faculty, and staff from different backgrounds. A beloved torts professor and our leader, Dean James Hackney. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. All of these uh, kind of gifts, wraps, flowers, it's very celebratory. Love it. So, uh, good morning. It's a pleasure to welcome you again to our 15th Women in the Law Conference. That deserves another <laughs> What an accomplishment this is. From the seed of an idea that was planted by Professor Emerita Judy Brown and our own Mio Marquis, a nourished, and nourished by so many of you here today. We now have an overflowing greenhouse flourishing and continually germinating through networks, friendships, and more. The law school commitment to women is well known. From our early days, 100 years ago, to today's first year class, of which women number 70%. Yeah. We have known that the power of women to practice law and to change the world is unsurpassed. If you haven't seen the cover of our law school's current magazine, I urge you to pick up a copy or read it online. I never leave home without it. <laughs> James, put the magazine down. <laughs> On the cover, you'll see Governor Maura Healey, class of 1998. Soon to be U.S. Senator, we hope. Uh, Massachusetts Senate President Karen Spilka, class of 1980. U.S. Attorney for Massachusetts Rachel Rollins, class of 1980. Federal Public Defender for Massachusetts Rhode Island and New Hampshire, Kiana Givens, class of 2002. Yeah. So let's, let's just do U.S. president, maybe. Let's, let's, let's make that happen. I do not believe that any other law school in the nation has two black women in the two top federal positions for a single state, let alone Senate president and governor. 
<laughs> These women are extraordinary, and we are so proud that they are our graduates. <laughs> In 2021, we celebrated the launch of the Brown Forum for Women in the Law. Thanks to the immense generosity of Professor Emerita, Judy Brown, and Jim Brown. With Judy and Jim's gift, we've been able to expand our Women in the Law Practitioners in Residence program. And next month, we will hold an event for graduates in New York City that will include programming supported by the Brown Forum. Although Judy and Jim could not be with us this year, I know they are with us in spirit. Again, we thank them for their tremendous financial support and their wisdom and guidance. We are also grateful to the Women in Law Advisory Group for their leadership, insights, and direction. Thank you for all you do for remaining involved in Northeastern law. Conferences such as this rely on both the dedication of our staff and leadership of our graduates. Thank you to our hardworking 2023 conference chairs, Amy Carlin with the law firm Major Lindsay, Siri Nelson with the National Whistleblowers Center. <laughs> and Juliana Spotford with a dentifil. <laughs> and to our powerhouse in-house team, Lindsay Sedonis. <laughs> We are also grateful to our many sponsors, for whom I'm sure Miel will be thanking later. And now, it's my pleasure to introduce up to the podium the incomparable, the wonderful Miel Martinez. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here bright and early. Um, we're just so thrilled. Um, James mentioned. It's our 15th year, and we started planning about 17 years ago. He did thank Judy and Jim. We're recording this so Judy can watch it. She promises she'll be back. We love you, Judy. She promises she'll be back um, next year. Um, I'm grateful to many of you who joined us last night. We had a really fun kickoff reception. I wanted to tell just one little story. We had a women-owned wine company that came, and all the wines were um, women-owned wines and women-owned distributors. And it was a married uh, couple, two women, and they found out Mary Venata was in the room. And they were, they were so moved, they made sure they ran up to meet her. And one, one of the two came back and said, oh my God, I got to meet Mary Venata. <laughs> and then the wife said, I didn't get to meet Mary Venata. <laughs> She's the reason we got married, and she might be the reason we get divorced. <laughs> but it was pretty funny. It was a special moment. Um, I wanted to uh, specifically thank our sponsors. We really can't do it without you. It's how this event happens year after year, and we get to bring in phenomenal speakers. Thank you to Somos and Gina Perini. Is Gina here as yet? I know she's coming. She may not be here as yet, but she's our... our uh, lead platinum sponsor and has been for many years. The Judy and Jim Brown Fund. Thank you to Eastern Bank and Kathy Henry. Is Kathy here as yet? I know Kathy's coming a little bit later. Thank you to Morgan Brown and Joy. GTC Law Group is GTC in the house. Yay! Thanks for bringing folks. Thank you to Colston and Stores and Karen O'Malley. Karen, please wave. We're grateful to you. Thank you to Bowditch and Tracy Thomas Boland, who brought 10 people. Thank you. Thank you. We have an incredible team.
team of advisors, and I just want to run through them really quickly. They help throughout the year. They keep me calm. They talk me off ledges. They do, <laughs> they do a lot of things. The advisory group consists of Judy Brown, Vanessa Candela, Amy Garland, Kelly Douglas, Kathy Henry, Sophia Lingos, Christina Miller, Karen O'Malley, Lily Palacios Baldwin, Gina Perini, Mala Rafiq, Cynthia Reed, and Rachel Rollins. And I keep asking Rachel, do you need to step off because you're in the high level <laughs> position? She goes, don't you take me off that bridge. <laughs> so, we have it. So, next I'd like to briefly welcome up our um, chairs this year. We have Amy Carlin, class of 00. She's the director of Major Lindsay in Africa. And she's a simpatico person with me. She's a ride or die. She's been with us for, uh, I think, three years. We have a real short hand now. And I would like Amy to come up and say a few words. And <laughs> So, um, yeah, you know, I have been around a while, and it's like that, you know, like once you find something that, like, uh -huh. makes you feel <laughs> as happy as I feel in this room with all of you, it's hard to leave. <laughs> but, but, um, so anyway, I'm so happy, of course, to be here today, happy to see all of you, happy that we're here in person. And I was listening, I'm a huge podcast junkie, and I was listening to a podcast the other day that really resonated with me, I want to share with you. So I was listening to this interview of Jane Fonda, who is, I mean, it was a great interview, it's uh, Julia Lewis-Dreyfus has this new podcast about um, interviewing older women, like the wisdom of older women need to be, you know, that needs to be disseminated more, right? And so she was interviewing Jane Fonda, and she was asking Jane Fonda about her mentors and, um, you know, growing up and, you know, through her career. And Jane Fonda said, um, I didn't have any mentors. I was brought up to not ask for help and to just plow through. And that's what I did. And it was, you know, it was a sad kind of moment. <laughs> and, and then she went on to say, you know, I, um, but when I turned 60, I got into activism and when I met women activists, they were the people who, they looked at me with kindness, with generosity, and humanity. And she said, I was completely touched in a way that I had never been before. And that is when I started to have mentors at 60 years old. And that, it just completely clicked when she said that, oh, kindness. Uh, you know, generosity, humanity, I just thought of this. I thought of Women in the Law, uh, this conference, because the connections that you make here when you walk into the room, that is what I feel, and that is what many of you have told me that you feel. Um, so I am so happy that you are all here, and I would encourage you throughout the course of the day to step into those connections uh, because you will not find the kindness, generosity, humanity, um, you know, other places that you will find here. So thank you so much. For Nelson, class of 19. As James mentioned, she's the executive director of the National Whist Whistleblower Center, which is getting lots of use of late. Uh, and she's also an adjunct here at Musel. She's a former BALSA chair. She's really actively supporting BALSA students as a class of 19 member, and we're really grateful for that. She reaches back, she gives back. Siri, will you come up and say a few words? <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm so happy to see so many people here today. On our way here I was talking with my co-chairs about how people literally don't want to do anything ever. <laughs> so any part we actually do get out of bed and go do something is a victory. <laughs> 
lot of what we'll talk about today is uh, reflecting things that are going backwards. So the anger that we all feel about those losses is real and valid. And it's okay that we feel it, but it's important to acknowledge that we're also all here together using our power to focus on solutions. And the connections that we're going to build today are going to help us work together to build those solutions. In the law, we are able to push so much radical change for people who don't even know what we're doing. Mm -hmm. The problem is that when we forget all of that change and how far we've come, we lose our power. So today, let's remember how much of a privilege it is to be here and how we need to use our power to continue to make change for women here in America, but everywhere in the world. Got a little bit of flex there. I know. <laughs> and last but not least, our third co-chair this year is Juliana Spofford, class of 1989. She's general counsel and chief privacy officer at Identified. We've worked together on multiple reunions and projects. She's a terrific partner, and I'm proud to be friends with Juliana. Please come back. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. So great to see you all here. Um, I can't believe it's been 50 years since the Women in Law Conference first started. I think I was at the first one, believe it or not. Um, in the last 15 years, I've probably been here about 10 years. I've spoken on at least two panels, and I just I love to see see everyone again at this conference and feel the energy in the room every year. And it's just been an amazing experience to be able to be one of the co-conference chairs and working with these amazing women and with Miel and uh, just we have such a, a great lineup of people here today for you guys to listen to um, and to interact with and make sure you bring out those business cards if you still have them and, and well a lot, of, a lot of people don't have them anymore and share them with, um, you know I've met many wonderful people through this conference over the years and um, the mission that it really does have is really to support female law lawyers and offer that practical cur current and very relevant information that women lawyers can put to use immediately and feel good about being female lawyers out in, in this in this difficult legal world a lot of times especially when i started out back not that long ago but you know i was a 1989 grad so i just wanted to talk a little bit about the theme women's rights are human rights today um it's very near and dear to me you know you would ask wow she's a general counsel and uh, chief privacy officer for a company how are women's right what, what's what's the connection there why are you so passionate about this however i really feel that you know um i'm all too familiar in the boardroom at the executive table you know with most of the guys in my company i'm really there are only two women i'm a small company in my in my company and um you know, the post-ops world and the issue of privacy rights in general are, are an issue that I believe is something that reverberates through the corporate world right now, too. And it will have an effect on all of our employees, on our boardrooms, on our policies, the way that we all practice law going forward. Like, we are asking questions such as, what policies should we be putting into place inside our companies to protect women's rights? How do we make sure that equity, diversity, and inclusion remains a huge part of our company's culture? How do we counteract the damage that's being done by recent Supreme Court decisions and the new state legislation that's popping up all over, the, uh, over this country that's enc encroaching on our employees' rights? These are real issues that in-house lawyers and outside counsel lawyers are dealing with and struggling with, even in the corporate world. So I want to make sure that you know, everyone knows that, you, you know, we need champions everywhere, not just in public interest law, but also in, in, the, in the corporate boardrooms and beyond. And I feel very strongly um, that I am one of those joyful warriors. This is a theme that will come up today that Umi talked, is Umi here yet? Yeah. Oh, there you are. That Umi brought up last night in, in a, this wonderful reception that we had to kick off the conference. 
And um, I am that joyful warrior too, and I hope that you will all be those joyful warriors as well. Um, so I look forward to this event today. I hope you'll be amazed. I hope you'll be inspired, that you'll be empowered and refreshed by the energy of all these incredible speakers. And um, have fun and uh, have a great conference today. Thank you, Miel. Thank you. Brad's going to get set. Next up, we have a really special treat for you to start your day and to put you in the perfect frame of mind. We're so fortunate to have Ella Marcus with us today. She's a student at Berkeley College of Music. She's incredibly talented. She already has many accomplishments under her belt. She is on the cast album of the 2023 live TV production of Beauty and the Beast, starring her. Is that how you say it, or is it H-E-R? I'm not that hip. Um, this, this song was that she's going to sing today was written by her mom, who is a dear friend from high school, back Aloha High School in Oregon. 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 <laughs> her mother's name is Lauren Kinnon. She's a dear friend. Her song is called 2020 Vision, Never Gonna Settle for Less. Lauren wrote this song never thinking we'd actually lose Roe versus Wade, but find... Um, but we just thought we'd find the wherewithal to codify it. Now look at the mess we're in. The lyrics stand now even more so. LF, please come on up. And work on <laughs> It's uh, such an honor to be here with all of you today. Know where we're going, but we're not going very fast. Just when the wall is crumbling, here comes the lie you thought would last. Look to the left.
my girls in the dreams not a cage for a queen or the wild in her eyes the family tree will bend and bow to the feminine the soul of you it's just the way that I absolutely positively know you can use the microphone for this one. Um, it is my distinct honor and real pleasure to introduce Milan Verveer to you. She's our keynote speaker this morning to kick off this conference. Um, when we found out that Milan said yes to coming to speak, we really did a little happy dance um, because she is the perfect person for you to hear from when it comes to the conference theme, women's rights are human rights. She was Hillary Clinton's chief of staff when then First Lady Hillary gave the now famous women right, Women's Rights Are Human Rights speech in 1995 at the UN World Conference on Women in Beijing. And Hillary spotlighted the work that still needed to be done on a global scale to ensure that women's rights were prioritized and included internationally in human rights law. And Milan later served as the first ever first ever uh, U.S. Ambassador for Global Women's Issues when Hillary Clinton was the Secretary of State and she was uh, appointed to this position by President Obama. Um, as Ambassador, she worked with Hillary to coordinate foreign policy issues and activities relating to the political, economic, and social advancement of women and women's rights throughout the world. Today, Milan is the Executive Director of Georgetown University's Institute for Women, Peace, and Security. She holds both a BS and an MS from Georgetown. She is the recipient of several honorary degrees. She is the co-author of the best-selling book, Fast Forward, How Women Can achieve, achieve Power and Purpose. And in 2011, she was named to Newsweek's 150 Women Who Shake the World's List. Now that, that's an accomplishment. <laughs> Milan has written many articles, she's been interviewed countless times, she's received a number of awards, and she's made it her life's work to champion women's issues across the globe. A quick Google search will find anything that you would like to find out about Milan, and also use the QR code in your program to look up more about her. Milan, we are thrilled to be here with us today. Thank you for traveling to this conference and uh, for sharing your insights with us about where we stand right now here in the U.S. with respect to women's rights, and we look forward to hearing from you. Well, thank you. <clears throat> I'm going to have trouble with my voice this morning, did you flip on but on bear on? with me. Uh, you flipped on the microphone? I did. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. yes. 
Thank you, Juliana, for the very generous introduction. It's such a pleasure to be with all of you for this extraordinary forum for women in the law. And I want to thank the co-chairs, Juliana, Amy, and Siri. You already provided much wisdom and inspiration for us this morning, but I know you've done so much to bring us to this day. And what can I say about Miel? <laughs> in getting to this point here in Boston that she leaves nothing that you wouldn't expect. Uh, impeccable efforts to detail and an extraordinary generosity of spirit. Miel, you are really special. And Ella, Ella was just amazing, don't you agree? Uh, <laughs> And we had the same thing last night with Umi, so it's just, uh, you're on a roll, and I hope I don't spoil all of that. <laughs> I want to begin by saluting uh, Northeastern Law for your commitment to certainly excellence in the law, but also to social justice, uh, to diversity, uh, for making a difference in the world. And I think that is something we desperately need, and this place is truly exemplary. Uh, and I have just learned so much in the last several hours that I have been here. Um, more power to you. We need you more than ever. You know, when I heard the dean uh, tick off some of the public officials who are uh, graduates of this place, I thought, let's just keep it going because we need this place in public office today. And the spirit... Uh, here is, is truly palpable. So I am particularly fond of this theme, women's rights are human rights, and you'll hear a little bit of why. Almost three decades ago, the UN Fourth World Conference on Women came together in Beijing, China, to strengthen women's rights as integral to human rights and to create a coherent strategy to make it real. It envisioned equality between men and women as fundamental to human rights. And it was there that Hillary Clinton, then First Lady, invited by the <laughs> Secretary General of the UN uh, to give a keynote speech, and she proclaimed something very simple, yet extremely radical to many. And that was that human rights are women's rights, and women's rights are human rights. Woo! Women are human. Women's <laughs> rights are human rights. Uh, it should be obvious, but it still is thought uh, by many uh, as something that should be realized. And in her historic address, she went through a litany of abuses against women, from domestic violence to rape as a tool of war, from human trafficking to honor killings from women who were denied the right to plan their families to dowry burnings. And after each of these, she said, this is a violation of human rights. Mm -hmm. And went on to say, it is no longer acceptable to hold women's rights as separate from human rights. And it was so interesting as she was speaking because we were in a cavernous room I don't know how many times the size of this room. And usually these audiences that come to UN sessions are very staid, hardly emote any emotions. You don't know what they're thinking, if they're listening at all. And as she mentioned some of these horrible human rights violations, dowry burnings, you could see and hear murmurings from women in Southeast Asia. As she mentioned, honor killings, same thing, women in the Middle East and beyond. And, and clearly her words were touching people who had struggled so much, like many of you, to bring about a better situation. <clears throat> and as she concluded and went to that crescendo of women's rights are human rights, human rights are women's rights, 
the audience started to pound uh, the, the tables that were in front of them. You could hear women <laughs> humming, we shall overcome. And many were openly weeping, including some of the press who traveled with us said to me, I hate to admit this because I'm not supposed to be biased but I was crying myself and proud for America that day. So just to understand um, the emotion in that room. And the conference went on uh, beyond a speech to produce a very lasting platform for action. And another interesting point is they did this by consensus. 189 participating nations agreed to that platform for action. That wouldn't happen today, in my view, because we are so polarized in so many ways, and the pushback you've already heard so much about uh, continues. And that's why there hasn't been another conference like this, because it is too risky to put something like this uh, to a vote. It called for action in 12 critical areas, including women's rights to education, to health care, the right to participate in the economies of our societies and in politics, the right to be free from violence and from discrimination. It was, in essence, a blueprint, a blueprint that we can still measure ourselves against today. And clearly, there have been many important gains, and I don't think we should downplay them because so many have worked so hard over so long to achieve the gains that have been made, uh, even though we have a climb still to get to the mountaintop where we want to go uh, with women's rights as human rights. And women in the law, as well as in other <coughs> areas of leadership, globally uh, have been on the front lines of advancing this progress. And your efforts certainly are not to be underestimated. And I hope you can appreciate uh, that in all you do. But regrettably, we all know that women's equality is still a challenge, both at home and around the world. And the pushback we are experiencing from authoritarian leaders, from fundamentalist forces, uh, from so many places, uh, is a concerted attack on women's progress and increasingly on democracy. So what is the status of women today. Just a, a, a few markers. The World Economic Forum, yes, those barons of economy and industry, actually produces a gender gap report every year. Now, why do they produce this report? Because in countries where the gap between men and women is closer to being closed, those countries are far more prosperous far more successful by a number of measures. And what this report does is it looks at four metrics. Women and education is the gap. How close is the gap to being closed? Health, uh, economic participation, and political participation. And they, they now have data in those four metric areas for 146 countries um, and say, as a result of what we're seeing today, just at the progress, the rate of progress we're making today, it will take 132 years to reach parity. Now, we don't have time to wait that long. Uh, so we have to find ways to accelerate the progress. And what they also found that's interesting is the gap, and maybe it's obvious to all of us, that the gap with, in education, health care, not perfect, but closer to being closed. Not so much in terms of women's economic participation by all the measures in that space, and women's political participation still closer to the bottom. Uh, the struggle goes on. In my own institute at Georgetown, we publish biennially a Women, Peace, and Security Index. Um, and it looks at three dimensions of women's well-being. So one dimension is inclusion. It's the one that most often gets looked at because it includes education, 
political participation, um, and the like. But we add two other dimensions. One is justice, something you can all relate to, looking at discriminatory practices and what's happening in that space. And the other is security. Are women secure in their homes? Are they secure in their communities? So you can have a girl going to school and that right being spectacular that she has, but if she is abused on the way to school or if her teacher is demanding uh, for her A that she deserves sexual returns, she is not secure. Uh, and, and what we find as a result uh, of this measurement of well-being of women is that in those countries, and we rank 176 by country, uh, the outcome where women are oppressed, where they lack opportunity, or even worse, those countries, no surprise, are mired in, in uh, fragility, uh, in conflict, in instability. They are the most dang dangerous places uh, and the greatest threats to peace and security. So in short, the well-being of women goes hand in glove with the well-being of countries. Now, countries where women prosper also tend to be healthier democracies. Uh, and as uh, Kamala Harris said, the status of women is the status of democracy. So a sense of just, if we didn't understand and we were talking to audiences that just don't get it, uh, how serious all of this is and, and how important it is for the outcomes that everybody should want to see. Now, it should seem obvious that the talents and participation of half the population of the world, uh, that when that experience and those talents are marginalized, global progress and prosperity will hit its own glass ceiling and continues to do so in too many places. So advancing women's equality <coughs> is not just the right thing to do, as has been described, the moral challenge of our time. But it is not also, it is not just, and that's an important, extraordinarily, a moral issue. It is also the smart thing to do. And we, when we were in the State Department, we added that smart thing to do because it was so difficult to get across why it is important to integrate gender into all areas, uh, for example, that the State Department was involved in, from economics to, uh, to human rights to what was happening in the regions of the world. Um, if the gender weren't integrated, the outcomes aren't what they should be. But if one made the arguments just on the basis of moral issues as persuasive as that should be, and only and as necessary as that is, it was difficult to get across. But if you could get across the self-interest that others who didn't get it uh, were, were not understanding, and they could understand how they could be more effective that they integrated gender, you had a better response because they could see it in their own work. And yet, as, and yet, you know, it's not a zero sum game. We know everybody benefits from this. And yet we are still far from finished with the work we also care about. Since Beijing, more countries have passed laws criminalizing violence against women and yet violence is pervasive around the world. It exacts a toll on all societies because laws are not often enforced, programs are not funded, these laws are not implemented. Yet prior to Beijing, this wasn't even on the agenda as a, a violation, a criminal violation. It was viewed as merely a private matter, a cultural matter. So in one sense, we've come a long way. In another sense, we should be farther ahead uh, than we are on these issues. 
And I don't want to get you all depressed as I go through. <laughs> I'll leave here with extraordinary guilt. Uh, but as we all know, we are still reeling from the Dobbs decision. 50 years of precedent upended by judicial activists, judicial activism. Uh, when I was working years ago on judicial confirmations, you know, a lack of commitment to legal precedent was grounds for disqualifying one from being confirmed. Uh, and now we've had this sweeping uh, activism on the bench hidden in some kind of originalist theories. Uh, but, but for a moment, and this was referenced earlier, uh, we are confronting legislatures in many, many states who are imposing, trying to impose draconian measures to further uh, restrict, uh, and that is going to be a challenge to people wherever they live and for those of us who can help in those places where we don't live. Uh, but also, we, we now have the specter of a, of a judge who, who, who says that there's a decision that the FDA made, uh, what, a couple decades ago on a drug that is proven to be safe and effective uh, was a wrongful decision. Uh, and, and potentially, given what the Supreme Court's going to do, we don't know, uh, upending even more. So we, we are up against it in terms of re women's reproductive health care, uh, the freedom to make the decisions that are right for us. <laughs> Maternal mortality is something we don't think about in the United States. But it continues to rise, and it is higher than any other high-income high country. Uh, and simultaneously, we're spending the most on health care than any other comparable high-income country. COVID has had a disproportionate impact on women in the United States and globally. And in the process, I think one of the things we need to understand is that it has exposed deep gender inequalities, which is one of the reasons that the stakes and the consequences were so high. We saw alarming increases all over the world in gender-based violence and severe setbacks for women in the workplace. Um, in the U.S., women lost more jobs than men for the first time ever in our history. Uh, and economists, frankly, refer to it as a she-session uh, instead of consequences of what you'd consider a recession uh, because so many mothers especially were impacted uh, by having to be the educators, uh, as well as losing the kinds of jobs that women tend to hold in the part of the economy that was hardest hit. And I don't think after all of this, we can consider childcare a marginal issue, uh, one that serious people in the Congress don't have to deal with, uh, because it is tied not only to the fates of women and their families, but also to our economy, and that should be uh, should be clear in arguments we keep making. <laughs> we are also the only industrialized country in the world that doesn't have paid parental leave. Uh, and, and we lag on equal pay, uh, and we certainly need to do better in terms of women's representation in politics and in boardrooms. I just want to mention two other areas, lest I have you all running out of this room in deep despair. <laughs> With respect to legal protections for women, the United States is one of only six countries in the world that includes Iran, Somalia, Sudan, Togo, and two Pacific Islands that has not ratified the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, or CETA. It has not been possible for us in all these years since it was adopted to gain the 67 votes, a supermajority, in the Senate that is required for ratification. Many cities have adopted CETA on their own, or, or what a women's rights convention would represent. Uh, as local laws. Uh, but when I travel overseas, inevitably, 
one of the questions I get constantly is why hasn't the United States ratified this convention to eliminate discrimination against women? It makes no sense uh, except to the people who continue to oppose it. Um, <clears throat> I testified on CETA probably the last time was 10 years ago. And that, and I regret to say that unless the awareness changes in our country, uh, we are not going to see a better outcome anytime soon. This is not the reality. Uh, in other countries, I remember being asked, uh, well, look at those countries that have ratified CETA. They're not exactly angels on women's rights. But what, the, what those senators who asked the question don't realize, that in those countries, CETA is a tool that the women have and they use it repeatedly to move their governments forward because those governments adopted a convention that they need to be bound to adhering to. Uh, so this continues to be um, uh, an issue that we confront along with the fact uh, that we can't seem to pass an equal rights amendment uh, to be added to our constitution to protect the rights of women and to codify gender equality. And I don't know how many of you know, there's been an effort, obviously, uh, now that a, the requisite number of states have ratified the Equal Rights Amendment, but they didn't do it in the time set, arbitrarily time set, in which to do that. So there's been an effort in the Senate currently uh, to an, allow the Senate, which most constitutional scholars and others say is absolutely doable. There's no impediment, um, but to, um, to 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 change that time limit to make it possible to effectuate the Equal Rights Amendment. Um, but unfortunately, in the last few days, on a procedural vote, 60 votes were not mustered, uh, and as a result, I think the chance for the Equal Rights Amendment this term is not going to happen. I'm sure there'll be more efforts, but we'll have to get different people in the Senate. Uh, to really make that change. And just very briefly, uh, moving from the United States for a moment, um, I just want to mention three other places in the world uh, that I think extraordinary things are happening um, in terms of, of women's, women's uh, leadership uh, and and attacks on them as well. We are seeing a terrible backlash against women, women's progress in Afghanistan, where the Taliban have issued now, as of today, more than 60 edicts to strip women and girls of their human rights. What is happening there is nothing more than gender apartheid. Women and girls are barred now from attending school beyond the age of sixth, sixth grade, the only place in the world, and there are a lot of bad places in the world, only place where there is a strict bar on women and girls going to school. Several months ago, they took away women's rights to attend university. Uh, women are barred from working. They made some very few exceptions where there was a desperate need, uh, but pretty much completely barred from working outside the home. They recently added being barred from working from NGOs and now in the last several weeks barred from working for the United Nations. This is really serious for a lot of reasons, but the country is undergoing an enormous humanitarian crisis in terms of uh, lack of food, everything collapsing. Uh, and in the process, it was the women working for the UN who were distributing uh, the food and the other assistance where it needed to go. Uh, they can no longer do that. Um, everything seems to be regulated, including how one dresses, which means you cover your face when you're outside. Um, women can no longer appear in public spaces like parks and enjoy them the way that, that men can. And they can't go anywhere outside their home without a male guardian. Uh, and, and just so much more. And as you sit here, think about what 
life is like if all of this is not possible. Uh, and and that's, that's where things are after 20 years of enormous progress. Uh, that progress has been turned back. We and so many others work to evacuate women human rights defenders uh, and women leaders uh, who were going to be most threatened when the Taliban came to power. Uh, and I must say, despite all of this, it is they in exile who are working so hard, staying in touch uh, with uh, women back in Afghanistan, with men who are, have been extraordinary allies, uh, working to find alternatives to education, uh, albeit temporary, until formal education can be uh, reintroduced, uh, but really working around the clock uh, to do what they can, uh, even though their own circumstances aren't what they would prefer them to be. Um, they would obviously prefer not to have had this happen uh, to, their, to their country after they worked so hard uh, to bring about change for women there. In Iran, women have been courageously leading a revolution, and it may be the only place uh, that has women leading a revolution right now. A young Kurdish woman, Masa Amini, died after being held um, in the brutal, held by the brutal morality police for allegedly wearing her hijab improperly. Only they would know. Uh, her death sparked a protest movement across the country. First, women, young women in particular, in the leadership of that movement, very quickly joined by male students uh, and by university communities, uh, and, and not long after that by men and women across Iran, people of all ages, all walks of life, um, all backgrounds, wanting an end to the repressive regime and its dictatorial rule. Uh, they have been willing to risk their lives for a cause bigger than themselves. And many of the protesters have been assaulted, imprisoned, killed. Uh, there has been every effort made by the regime to silence the brave women of Iran. Their voices, however, have been and continue to be vital. They are not giving up. They are catalysts for change. And I think you've all seen the banner under which they are waging their protest. Uh, which is women, woman, life, freedom. And men, women across Iran are using that uh, as their battle cry. And in Ukraine, the unprovoked full-scale invasion by Russia rages on. Uh, Russia has ignored international humanitarian law on the conduct of the war and targeted facilities civilians with airstrikes on hospitals, schools, homes, railway stations, power plants, water systems. Paying, they're paying a huge price there in terms of death and destruction for defending their independence, freedom, and democracy. But attacks on the civilian population, as you all know from international law, are crimes against humanity, war crimes, among them is the pervasive use of rape uh, to terrorize mostly women. Those responsible for ordering and committing such crimes obviously need to be held accountable. And so NGOs are working to investigate and document these cases. It's very hard to get this evidence. It's very hard for women in these horrific situations they've been thrust into uh, to be willing to, to talk about their circumstances. Um, and in addition to bringing them assistance for their physical uh, support and, and to deal with their traumas, they are trying to uh, ensure that the cases will be able to be uh, brought to justice. There's a young woman, Alexandra Matichuk, who recently got the Nobel Peace Prize for her work in an NGO. Uh, and it's like so many, she's representative of so many who are working uh, to document uh, these cases in a way that they will be ready for prosecution uh, when that time comes. Um, and women across Ukraine in this 
horrible, horrible situation they find themselves in. Uh, they are engaged in the security sector. There are some 20 percent uh, in the military and the armed forces now as diplomatic advocates making the case around the world. Uh, they're among the brave journalists and policymakers um, providing desperately needed humanitarian assistance, running schools, the mothers who have been displaced uh, in order to move their children to, to areas of greater security. Uh, just a couple of days ago, I was sent the cover of Forbes magazine, Forbes magazine, Ukraine, and on the cover, and this is rare for Ukraine, it's been historically very patriarchal in many ways, uh, but there it's a cover of women, much like the cover of Northeastern law and those public officials, um, of, of women, a couple were in uniform, and the rest were doing this extraordinary leadership work. So I think one of the, the big things to remember uh, and understand is, yes, women are victims of these conflicts, but they are leaders. Uh, and this was said to me so well one night in Kabul years ago uh, when I was with a small group of women, and the first one said to me, stop looking at us as victims and look at us as the leaders that we are. And I thought about that long and hard because... I'd go back to that mahogany conference table in the State Department. And if women were considered in the policy discussions, it was, well, how can we assist them in ways that are needed? And clearly, that's good. But rarely, if ever, as, as key investments in, in creating businesses or in sitting at, at the table where decisions are being made. Um, and so I think that's always been a, a reminder for me um, that not to look at these women, in the, even in the worst of circumstances, as victims because they don't want to be seen that way and they should not be seen that way uh, because they are leaders and they deserve better. And on this cover of Forbes was the headline that ran across it, and it was a quote from one of the women, which is, um, doing everything we can. Mm -hmm. That's what they were doing in each of their areas of pursuit, doing everything we can. And I thought for all of us, doing everything we can is the imperative that we should have as well. In addressing women's access to justice, we realize that raising our voices for equal rights and equal treatment under the law is very necessary, but not sufficient for reaching the goals we seek. <coughs> Laws must be backed and enforced by effective action, um, both in government and uh, through advocacy beyond. There's much we can all do, much that you are already doing, but women on the front lines as change makers, both here at home and around the world. So just a few things uh, about where we need to be working to address gender norms, attitudes, conscious and unconscious bias, really at the root of so much. To bridge the gap between laws and practice, transforming policies into realities requires the commitment on all levels. We need to counter the backlash to gender equality, which comes from many sources fundamentalist groups, populist authoritarian governments that are demonizing and misrepresenting gender equality as a threat to families and traditional values. You know, there's an extraordinary convention against um, gender-based violence in Europe um, called the Istanbul Convention. And many, many governments have ratified it. But because of what's going on, some are now de-ratifying and in Turkey, in the middle of the night, uh, Erdogan de-ratified Turkey from the Istanbul Convention, of all conventions. Uh, and there's tremendous pressure on other governments uh, not to ratify who were on the cusp of ratification. We need to foster democratic inclusion and accountability, women as decision makers and monitors to hold leaders important, which is why it's so important when we applaud the public officials that have been produced by this law school, 
uh, it matters in what they will do um, much beyond the immediate um, requirements of their office. We need more women in politics, as hard as it is at every level. And we need to harness the technologies that hold promise for empowering women and girls on many fronts. But social media, as we all know, and AI can be used for good or for malign purposes. When harnessed, it can be a powerful tool. But what we're seeing in so many places, it's increasingly being used to target women, particularly in politics, with misinformation and attacks, and that's only going to get worse. Uh, I think you saw that the White House yesterday, uh, there was a meeting on AI. It is, we have no idea what is yet to come. I have a friend who's at the top of a major corporation, and she said, there's garbage being programmed in, and that garbage is going to come out and haunt all of us. Uh, so another area uh, that we must keep in mind. It was 175 years ago that a group of women and some very supportive men, including Frederick Douglass, uh, who came together to adopt a Declaration of Sentiments, a kind of very early Beijing platform for action, but it was for the United States. It called for women's equal rights in America and was adopted at the first Women's <coughs> Rights Convention in Seneca Falls, New York. One of the brave women who participated was a 19-year-old glove maker. Her name was Charlotte Woodward, and I've often thought about what she wrote about that time. She worked very long hours with no hope of keeping her meager wages. She could not own property, as women could not. She couldn't vote. If her marriage went south, she couldn't get a divorce. She and so many others were desperate for change. So Charlotte decided to go to the first Women's Rights Convention in hopes of securing a better life. And she wrote that on that day, she was terrified when she set out to go because she feared no one else would come. Mm -hmm. The road was empty for the longest time. She was starting out in the dark. But then when she got to a crossroad and the sun came up, she saw women and men in carriages or wagons or on foot <coughs> gradually forming a long procession to the road to equality. And we're still on that road to equality. Women from across America and from every continent in the world still together on that road. I thank you for all that you have done, dedicated to the law, for promoting social justice, for leading change, for advancing progress, walking the extra mile, which is required of all of us today. We need to continue our effort to push the agenda forward, to do otherwise we know would hold back one of the most powerful forces for shaping the globe, women's equality. Women's rights are human rights, and we cannot settle for anything less. Thank you. Oh, okay. do you want to have a seat for this part? You're more than welcome to. Yes, if you'd like to have a seat. We're, we're moving to a Q and A. Everybody can't see me if I sit. Okay, okay. I'll just stand. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm now like a two fisted with water. Out of water. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I had hoped to have a microphone available to maybe facilitate some of the questions that come. So we don't have it available because we want Milan to stay mic'd. So if you have a question, please 
rise and Elevate. speak as loud as you can. Or <laughs> even your comments about what we should all be doing. Any good ideas are welcome. <laughs> I know this isn't a shy group, so please, this is your chance to ask uh, someone who is in the room with Hillary and who has done many, many amazing things um, around the globe. We could also poll call you. <laughs> I'll ask a question. One, thank you. Um, I feel like many of us have benefited from all of the trailblazing work you have done, um, so thank you for sharing with us this morning. I'm curious if you're seeing younger women really engage on, um, uh, because for, for at least the last decade, maybe it's changing a little recently, I have felt often that I'm one of the youngest in the room or the youngest at the protest or the youngest in the courtroom. And I'm wondering if you're seeing a shift in any way in the United States right now in that regard. Well, I don't have um, any particular case studies to point to, but I think it's what many of us see, uh, which is in reaction to Dobbs, for example, a tremendous uh, outcry, but more than that, people really, uh, and I think young women and men, uh, really stepping up to the plate and engaging in politics the way they hadn't. And we had the Women's March, which was a reaction, uh, but I think this is something even more um, pervasive because it's state after state uh, and there's been a lot of comment on the midterm elections that we just went through um, where this issue crystallized in many places and brought people to the point of engagement, young people where they hadn't been heretofore. I'm at a university and I see uh, just a lot of worry about the future uh, and a lot of uh, trying to figure out how to make a difference. Um, for example, um, even in the business school, where you expect that or may expect that the, the career path is going to be, you know, how, how well can I do by a certain measure? A lot of it today is social impact. How can we change the needs of the world, whether it's climate or whether it's in other areas, uh, by figuring out the best utilization of tools we've never used for that before, but to bring about change. So my hope is in the future generation. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we all see it. Uh, maybe adversity really has to strike closer to home to realize, for them to realize that the world is, is threatening to them, uh, whether it's in personal matters, in their private lives, uh, as the Dobbs decision, or whether it's something like climate change, which is the existential threat of our time. Uh, and it's the young people. I was at the climate, the last three climate conventions. It is young people out in the streets pushing those negotiators to do more than they're willing to do uh, and, and keeping that conversation going, even though they're not allowed, for the most part, to be inside. I also see more and more multilateral organizations or organizations um, that may not consider youth uh, as part of who they are, the composition of their participants, now increasingly reaching out to young people to, to in, assure them that, they're, uh, that they have a role at the table and that they are wanted. So I'd rather be optimistic, although, you know, Madeleine Albright was asked, is she an optimist? And she said, yes, I'm an optimist who worries a lot. <laughs> and I'm an optimist who worries a lot. And I'm optimistic about our young people. Thank you. Anyone else over here? Um, thank you again to, to echo. Um, yes, uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, also, uh, you did give us a, a lot of background on, on things that are going against women right now. Are there any places that are actually furthering women's rights at the moment? And is that, is, first of all, is there such a place? And if so... <laughs> you're in it, you're in it. <laughs> Outside of this room, um, is, are there any models or guides for... You know, there are. And, you know, if you look at any of these data sets, uh, 
and albeit they're smaller countries, but the Nordic countries do exceptionally well. They hit it out of the park constantly uh, on a range of issues, but particularly issues having to do with gender equality. Uh, you know, even in a place like Ukraine, which is going through unimaginable horrors, what the women are doing is getting a lot of notice, um, but in a good way, because while they have struggled over decades to get the, the prominence and the, uh, the, the kind of expectations that should be there in terms of what they represent, today, everyone, including many of the men who are asked, are saying it's going to be different when this is over. The women will be at the table in greater numbers. So while on the one hand, it is a tough time, uh, but on the other hand, there are, look at Iran. Who thought that young women would bring the country? Uh, now, the regime is still strong, albeit, but it is, it is not what it was. And by, by chipping, chipping, chipping away, um, the time is going to come when they can no longer stay in power. So I, I think it would behoove all of us not to dwell as bad as it is on some of the setbacks, but how do we overcome those setbacks? And, and how are we, I go on doing what I do, honestly, because I see what women in so many parts of the world are doing, even at home. Uh, and that is inspirational. And I, I keep thinking, how can you sit back when they're doing so much, and they are real change makers. Uh, so yes, it's tough, but there are, even in the toughest places, they are breaking through. Thank you. Hi, thank you, that was a wonderful talk. Um, I'm curious, in early in your career, when you were getting into politics or early on your path, were you always interested in focusing on women's rights, or were you maybe working on something else, and suddenly you were like, well, I have to pay attention to this before anything else is going to change, and how you sort of got to where you are. I wasn't focused on women's rights. I was very engaged on civil rights, which women's rights are a segment of, obviously, uh, on the independence of the judiciary, on a whole basket of issues, on politics. But it really wasn't until Beijing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm that both for me and for Hillary, it was life-changing. It was, and that's why I was so fond of the theme uh, and told Niel, I'd be happy to do it because your theme was right. Uh, it, it was so meaningful because it was so, to, ha to see what so many go through and struggle for uh, and how they overcome uh, was something that, touched her, touched me, uh, and frankly, um, have never stopped being affected by it for the last 25 years. So that's, that was really one of those life-changing moments. Uh, and it wasn't so much being in a place at a certain time. It was really understanding in ways, perhaps, that I never did just how important these issues are. Thank you so much. I echo the gratitude on a rainy Friday. We don't need it anymore. <laughs> so I have a question. I was part of an interesting conversation at the state and city level yesterday. I work at a bank. Um, and the, the, the conversation was interesting because I've never heard it before, which is the, for the Commonwealth and even the city of Boston, should we be using our record, interest, policy work around really um, choice, uh, commitment to um, climate change, you know, um, as well as some of our more progressive policies um, as a way to support the local economy and attract talent and retain the talent that comes here for school and we know where that talent is going, right? And because of the cost of living. So it's really using progressive policies at the local and state level as a means to drive the local 
national economy, making the business case for those progressive policies. And, and the fact that we even that we were even having those conversations, sort of leaders in, in companies locally, gave me hope for the future. And, and one of the interesting things that um, that they showed was a picture of when you go into New Jersey that says, welcome to New Jersey, we don't ban books. So that's <laughs> <laughs> I've never been a part of that conversation before, and I'm, I'm really excited that we're having that conversation. And I have the privilege of working at a company that is only based in this neck of the woods. So for us, we lean in. The business case is quite clear. It's more difficult for companies that might have a plant in Ohio and a plant in you know different parts of the, the country. Are you seeing that in any of your work where there's where, where there's power in telling a progressive story as a means to drive local economies? Yes, and I think your story here is one of many. Um, but you also see on a larger scale today um, so much negativity coming from certain parts of our country. Uh, and that's playing on the, it, the antithesis of what you said. So the other side of what you said is moving with your feet, you know, uh, and going to other places to send a message. Uh, probably where you see this the most um, is when there's been a, a terrible political setback. Let's take uh, any number of issues we're dealing with. <laughs> uh, where the first call will be to the corporate sector in the states. Uh, you know, boycott or um, take actions that will demonstrate to other audiences not to come uh, unless the change happens. So I think the power of the business community, for example, there is a big effort today, uh, ESG for anybody who's involved in, in, in business, um, you know, sustainability, governance, it's, it's equality, what the business community can do. Now, business has adopted ESG to many of them to pat themselves on the back and say, look, you know, our company is a great company. Um, uh, here's, here's what we're doing under the ESG banner. Now, there's not a whole lot of accountability, and that needs to be fixed, but the idea is a powerful one, and it has brought about considerable change, certainly in the area of sustainability by a number of companies. But there's a huge pushback from the right wing against ESG. And you're like, what the heck? They're, now they're against ESG. And they're trying to make the case that, let's say I'm Coca-Cola. I'm completely committed to ESG. We're demonstrating how we're doing it. Well, their argument, the other side's argument is, oh, they're being unfair to their shareholders because of these progressive ideas they have. And so their shareholders are losing out. In truth, the companies are doing better by their shareholders. So I, I think this whole area that you touch on, whether it's public officials making a place more attractive for people to come and, uh, and, fl and flower uh, in their lives, uh, or using what's happening um, in other places uh, to ensure that that doesn't happen in their place and to send a message about it. Uh, you see it manifested in different ways, but I think increasingly it's going to be a big part of uh, what happens. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for your talk. You, you talked a little bit about CEDA and the fact that um, even though the U.S. hasn't uh, uh, ratified it, there's this push for cities to start to ratify it. In Chicago, we took a portion of that with the safe cities um, and focusing on street harassment with girls. Uh, my question is, there's a bit of pushback there because um, people are saying, well, we don't really need a gender lens when it comes to violence, specifically in Chicago. And so I just wanted to ask you what your uh, recommendation is to address that because even understanding and explaining to people the framework that Taking a gender lens doesn't mean that you no longer pay attention to violence as it involves boys or, you know, men. It's just a, a different lens in looking at violence against women and girls. You know, I think one of the problems is that we look at this issue area on a, you know, the wider basis of it. 
as a zero-sum game, that people say, <coughs> if, if we put the emphasis on her, we're not going to put the emphasis on him. If she prospers, he can't prosper. It's, it's, that it's just zero-sum. When the reality is that everybody benefits from this. There are large numbers of evidence-based studies today that show that gender equality benefits enormously. Um, you know, I had a, a situation, I was in India, and there, were, um, there was a, an organization that wanted to do more because there's so much abuse of women, gender-based violence in the villages, uh, but there's also lack of education, et cetera. Uh, and so there was a small grant made to a group um, of men who were doing skits to keep other men from violating women. And they played out this skit, and I could see when the hand was going up to attack her, another was pushing that arm back. Uh, and all of these, these roles were played, the men and women roles were played by men. And about a year later, I got a call from the head of the, the organization, and um, she said, are you coming back to India anytime soon? The men want to meet with you. I thought, oh, geez, what's happened? Um, and I said, well, I didn't have any plans. Long story short, I did get back. And when I met with them, I said, so you're going to tell me everything is much better in the village? Oh, yes, yes, yes. But they didn't want to talk about that. I said, so why did you want to talk to me? And then they said, because we want you to know we've changed. Their attitude, they, they said that they were always understanding of the, their role uh, as men, giving permission and ways to act that were not really ways that they should have appropriately acted towards women. But that was their, that, those were the attitudes that were deeply entrenched in their way of life. And they wanted to tell me how liberated they were uh, from having that weigh them down anymore. And, and, you know, the same thing happened with a different issue in Sweden, where they had, for the first time, paid parental leave. And at first, the men didn't want to take it because they thought it was going to harm their careers. Uh, and then the government changed it to, to basically show that you know, if you don't take it, it's not that your wife can get it. This is going to be lost. And so more and more, we're signing up for it. And today, what everyone is saying is, why, why were we deprived of bonding with our babies all of these years? You know, this has just become so extraordinary. And it's this whole understanding of you're a co-beneficiary. Men benefit from the good things that can happen, whether they're giving up violence against women, whether they're playing their role as fathers in, in their domestic life in ways they hadn't, um, et cetera. So I think it's this attitude that if you focus on women somehow, the guys are going to lose. And we've got to change that. <coughs> so I think, frankly, a number of local jurisdictions are doing more and more to take the components of CEDA or ERA and putting it in their policies uh, on a local level. Much of the ways that in four earlier years in our government, uh, when we weren't to say climate change, uh, you could use the word environment, but not climate change, uh, that all of our policies were get out of the Paris Agreement, don't have anything to do with climate who saved us? It was the companies that were signed on to really working on these issues. It was the city and states that did so much to keep it going. Uh, so we do need everybody in this. And I think just ways to, to demonstrate not that it means ignoring men and boys. In fact, it means raising up everybody. <laughs>